Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Friedman, Professor and Interim Chair of Dermatology at GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, I'm joined by Yasmin Kokorian, who is Assistant Professor of Dermatology and Interim Chief of Pediatric Dermatology at Children's National. And I am very fortunate that she is going to interview me. So let's do it. Yeah, it's the, the, mass, the, the pupil has become the master, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm very excited. Thank you, first of all, for having me in your session. Sure. So you mentioned your top 10 list, the first 10 things in your 10 seconds you'd be thinking of. Can you tell us what they were? Oh God, there are a ton of them. So first of all, back, we're talking about top 10 off-label immunomodulators. You have to throw out hydroxychloroquine, dapsone, colchicine, low-dose naltraxone. I didn't mention it before because someone else in the session was gonna talk about, it. we've got a whole host of antibiotics, uh, low-dose doxycycline, minocycline. Now we have sericycline, which is anti-inflammatory for acne. Um, certainly you can also throw out some other weird ones like pentoxifilin. Um, you can think about, oh God, where else to go? Zinc, you can think about uh, even possibly vitamin D. There is some in, in increasing roles for vitamin D in inflammatory disease like urticaria. I think that was about 15 seconds? I think, yeah, yeah I think number. that was 15 yeah. seconds and at least 15. Yeah. So let's go to the weird ones. You'd mentioned petoxyphylin, an oldie, but you love it. So why yeah. don't you tell us about it a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so it first came across uh, my desk uh, when a paper, I believe, came out maybe about eight years ago using looking at petoxyphylin plus hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of lipodermatosclerosis. Um, and I'd heard about it, you know, from uh, some of my mentors at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, Michael Fisher, Steve Cohen, uh, and, and we used it, but I didn't really know why. Um, and it only was recently that I actually found out we've known why for a really long time. Uh, the mechanism of action of petoxyphilin, which is anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrogenic or fibrolytic, uh, was actually discovered by Brian Berman uh, in the late 1980s. Um, and so it's been used off-label for a long time in dermatology, more than that in combination, kind of peripheral vascular disease-ish diseases that are really inflammatory. So lipodermatosclerosis, maybe even li necrobiosis lipoidica. Mm -hmm. We don't know the full pathophysiology, but, but no question, you know, vascular uh, you know, dysfunction could be part of that. Um, but even more recently, you know, in terms of where I use it, I've been using it quite frequently for benign pigmented purpuras, which, which, fits, which fits in that spectrum. You know, you're talking about a disease where for some reason there's increased vascular permeability, extravagated red cells, there's a little bit of capillaritis, and this, well, histologically is not so threatening, from a clinical perspective, these patients are distraught. You know, they're about six different subtypes. They come in many flavors clinically and all of them are pretty much hated. And what do we have for it? Zero, we got nothing. We give vitamin C, topical steroids, they don't do anything. Um, and so there are a couple of nice uh, clinical studies looking at petoxyphilin for benign pigmented purpuras. Uh, this would be 400 milligrams three times a day. Okay. And it does work quite nicely. In terms of clinical considerations, if a patient's on any other anticoagulants, you probably want to be cautious because it was meant to be a blood smoother, not thinner, so to speak. Uh, any patients with uh, theophylline hypersensitivity, given they are somewhat similar, you should avoid. But otherwise, you know, it's a pretty safe medication. And it's one of those why not medications. Okay, that sounds great for a condition that we don't have much to do. Yep. It's worth a try. Absolutely. What about naltrexone? It's so hot right now. Yes, yeah, super hot right now. I feel like we're on Zoolander. Um, <laughs> so it's not actually naltrexone, 50 milligrams, which is commercial available, but low-dose naltrexone, which is three milligrams. I see. The biggest, I guess, hurdle, which to me hasn't been so far, is actually getting, because it has to be compounded. So if you're a good compounding pharmacy, they can actually crush up your 50 and make pills of three milligrams. Now you assume that that would be very costly. It's actually pretty cheap. It's about $100 for 90 days. Okay. Um, and some places even $60 for 90 days. So it, it really is quite inexpensive. Obviously this will be a chronic therapy, but the difference between the three versus the 50 is, is, is pretty, pretty significant. That low dose only temporarily blocks the opioid receptors. And that temporary inhibition is what upregulates something called OGF, opioid growth factor, which has a lot of different interesting properties in terms of toll-like receptor downregulation, regulation of the cell cycle, um, and, and there's a whole host of other things I won't get into. Um, but it, that's why you can't just say, well, three milligrams work, let's go with 50. You actually will not get that benefit okay. from the higher dose. But where is it being used? I mean. I hate cure-alls. The idea sounds completely non-scientific, but the reality is it's being used everywhere. Everything from Haley Haley for some reason, maybe that's the cell cell proliferation impact, uh, to lichen planopilaris. I'm actually using it in my mast cell activation syndrome hmm. uh, patients. But you know, if you follow the literature, if you 
if you PubMed, I was about to say Google, which please don't do. Uh, if you PubMed low dose naltrexone, you're going to find papers on every which way disease, and this is even goes beyond dermatology. So pretty accessible, minimal to no side effects. It's kind of those why not medications yet again mm -hmm. um, that could have significant benefit. I wouldn't use it as monotherapy. I would combine it with other medications. But as uh, Jerry Shapiro says from uh, NYU with the use of it for lichen planus pilaris, he pretty much uses third line on top of, for example, doxycycline, pioglitazone, or some immunomodulator. That's exciting. Um, you love to talk about urticaria. Can you give us a sense about what you like to use? What's your regimen, and what are these uh, what are these unusual top ten drugs you yeah. like? Yeah. So, so the the ones I talked about in today's session were more third line. Okay. So we, we do have a lot of non sedating antihistamines. I always recommend second generation non sedating, but they are sedating. You know, antihistamines because things like levocetirazine, cetirazine, they will knock a lot of people out. Mm -hmm. Fexofenadine probably the least so. Mm -hmm. So these therapies, dapsone and colchicine, maybe even low dose naltrexone. Uh, even going a little far, you know, far-fetched cannabinoids. Mm. So there's evidence that cannabinoids can actually stabilize and prevent mast cells from releasing histamine. Um, these are going to be added on top of that. It's not going to be I in see. place. So once you optimize your patient fourfold the recommended dose of antihistamines and they're not controlled, that's where you may think of dapsone. That's where you may think of colchicine okay. and any of these other therapies. Oh, that's exciting. Um, and anything else that you would do, like would you use those in place of using omalizumab or you think that they are yeah, better first no, line to go to? Yeah, that's an interesting question because omalizumab is the only FDA approved systemic immunomodulator that we have. The problem is it's, it is, for all intents and purposes, a safe medication. You have to have the right setup. You have to stir it for about 30 to four or five minutes before using because it's extremely viscous. Mm. And you got to keep the patient around for about two hours afterwards because of that risk of that black box for anaphylaxis. Mm. So if you do not have the setup in your practice, it's just a non-starter. Uh, my advice for that is find a local infusion center or a local allergist because they've been using it for asthma for many, many years. Um, and so for me, that's, that's typically what I do. I just... You know, why reinvent the wheel? I, you know, academic center, I have an infusion center and a bunch of allergists. Why would I try to make life difficult? So I, I send those patients there and I do use it a lot and it's a great biologic. Um, but yeah, I probably would, if for more severities, go with that. But if a patient, for whatever reason, is adverse to that, I think certainly dapsone, colchicine are, are good options to add on. That's great. Um, is there anything else you talked about you'd like to highlight that you think is... Yeah, you know, I think as dermatologists, we thrive on off-label use. You know, we are incredible at it because of the way we're taught, the way we're trained in that there's such a huge focus on pathophysiology of disease, but also a very big uh, focus on the mechanism of action. You know, nowadays residents coming out, if you can't, as a rep, you can't tell them how your drug works, goodbye, not happening because of that emphasis. And so I really encourage our colleagues to get creative. And, and that's, you know, for, you know, thinking about another drug I didn't mention, uh, pioglitazone for lichen plano pilaris. How did we even learn about that? That was in a cutting edge article in what was called Archives of Dermatology, now JAMA Dermatology, mm -hmm. that really stimulated that interest and use. And it was actually that paper that got me thinking about using it. So my, my advice is be creative. What you said in, in, in our previous interview, publish it and talk about it.